Welcome back. Vince Graham here, the seventh in a series describing an opportunity for South Carolina. This segment introduces the idea of leveraging water resources for recreation and economic development. Our state has a long history of this. For example, the Santee Canal opened in 1800. It was America's first summit canal, so called because it connects two bodies of water at different elevations via canal lock. The Santee Canal was 22 miles long and provided a shortcut between the Santee and Cooper Rivers so that boats traveling downriver from Columbia could avoid having to go to the ocean to get to Charleston. It was considered one of the crowning engineering achievements and economic development projects of its day. It served business in the state until 1850 when railroads made it obsolete. Most of the canal was covered up when Lake Moultrie was built in the 1940s. Marinas are common in the low country. The one at Patriots Point accommodates 459 boat slips with 17 thousand linear feet, more than three miles of floating dock space. At 19,000 linear feet of dock space, the Charleston City Marina is even larger, covers more than 40 acres of water on the Ashley River. There are a few drawbacks with conventional marinas like this. First, the docks project out into public waters, making the infrastructure and boats more exposed to the elements. Second, the distance from a boat docked at the marina to shore can be quite a hike, making it inconvenient to haul stuff back and forth. And unlike port cities like Annapolis, shown here, and Nantucket, where the marinas are more a part of the city, the large marinas on Charleston Harbor are locationally challenged. They're off the beaten path away from the action. It's more than a mile as the crow flies from the city marina to the corner of Meeting and Market Street, and more than a mile and a half from Patriots Point to Shim Creek. Transient boaters must hire a taxi to go out to eat or otherwise get around. A third challenge, with the city marina at least, is that the Ashley River is silting in. The private operator has permits pending before the Department of Health and Environmental Control to move its outermost dock another 100 feet out into the Ashley River. The estimated cost is $5 million, and concerns have been raised over environmental and visual impacts of such an expansion. Contrast marinas that project out into the water with small sheltered harbors like Hopetown in the Bahamas. These offer better protection from waves and storms. Docks are within easy walking distance of stores and restaurants. You see the same thing in European port towns like La Rochelle on the western coast of France. The thousand-year-old city surrounds the marina, making it into a watery square and significant public space. Restaurants and shops are within an easy walk of the marina. You see the same type urbanism in the Mediterranean, famously picturesque places like Portofino in Italy and Saint-Tropez in France. The other cool thing about places like Saint-Tropez, um, excuse me, the other cool things about places like Saint-Tropez and Portofino is they create tremendous real estate value in places to walk and dine. These cities served as Charles Fraser's inspiration for building Harbor Town on Hilton Head 40 years ago. Rather than project out into Calabogie Sound, he wanted the marina to be an urban place surrounded by buildings. In the process, he created an iconic South Carolina landmark with immense real estate value. The problem with Harbor Town, though, is that it accumulates silt and sediment at the rate of about 10,000 cubic yards a year and must be dredged every four to five years at a cost of about a million dollars. With that economic challenge in mind, Fraser, ever the innovator, in conjunction with J.R. Richardson, developed Windmill Harbor on the north end of Hilton Head about 20 years ago. Windmill Harbor utilizes an ingenious lock system, not unlike that used on the aforementioned Santee Canal. Boats up to 85 feet in length move between the intercoastal waterway and marina through this lot. In more than 20 years, the marina has never needed dredging. Among its other advantages is that there is no tidal fluctuation or wakes from high-speed boat traffic. Sea life doesn't grow on the bottom of boats, and fishing inside the harbor is fantastic. They've also got an active yacht club with an outstanding junior sailing program. The Lock Harbor concept has also been utilized at Wexford Plantation on Hilton Head and Queens Harbor outside Jacksonville. All three locks were designed by capable engineers with Thomas & Hutton, which has offices in Mount Pleasant. If you're curious about how locks work, I've included a link to a 23-second film about their operation in the description under this YouTube video. Such a lock would be located between, between the marina and the open water. Another advantage of a marina basin that is created out of the landmass is it allows you to construct buildings over water in a manner that modern regulations no longer allow. For example, in Nantucket, small buildings are built on the docks. These buildings house boutique restaurants, ship stores, art galleries, and even small residences. Another idea, as at Windmill Harbor and Hopcall Yacht Club with their excellent sailing programs, these marinas could serve as the ideal headquarters for a Mount Pleasant community sailing program, similar to what you see in other parts of the country. 
I'd recommend two marinas, one about 10 acres and the other about 5 acres, roughly the size of East Lake and West Lake in Ion. The marina basins could be connected with canals of the type made famous in Venice, Italy, Amsterdam, and Holland, and Bruges in Belgium. As with Amsterdam and Bruges, the locks would keep the water at a constant level. They aren't difficult or costly to build. We built two of them between the lakes and Ion. In fact, we still have a few lots remaining on the canals. If interested, give me a call. And canals don't have to be limited to just residential use. Like the Riverwalk in San Antonio, there can be cool restaurants, hotels, and office buildings along the waterways that become popular destinations. So to summarize, here's the 400-acre Patriots Point property with the three-mile-long path to liberty shown in orange. Here's our Low Country Botanical Garden, our finest front porch in the south, our culturally significant performing arts theaters, a couple of Lock Harbor marinas, one 10 acres and one 5 acres connect these marinas with canals. These could be built in phases with three locks connecting to Charleston Harbor. Patriots Point Marina has 459 slips. This provides a rough indication of the number of slips the basins could accommodate this many in the 5-acre basin and more than twice that number in the 10-acre basin. Now, lock marinas aren't cheap. With the help of engineers at Thompson Hutton, I priced one out several years ago for a development on Amelia Island in Florida. Based on that pricing, I'd, I'd conservatively estimate the cost of two marinas, canals, and three locks connecting to Charleston Harbor to be $50 million. On the positive side, owners of expensive boats like to keep them in protected places. Boat slip sales could easily amount to more than $60 million. Plus, you'd create substantial real estate value along the canals and marinas and priceless intangible values of a civic and social nature. If this seems difficult or far-fetched, well, so did the Ravenel Bridge at one time. As demonstrated, South Carolinians are capable of creating places of awe and wonder. The 400-acre asset owned by the citizens of our state is wor worthy of the imaginative effort necessary to convert it into such a place. I'll leave you with this thought from the late philosopher and recipient of the 1982 Presidential Medal of Freedom, Eric Hoffer. Until next time, I'm Vince Graham. Thanks for watching.